Um, since uh, the theme of this conference seems to be computer incunabula, uh, I will spend most of my uh, time on describing the, uh, the first two computers uh, we had at the University of Toronto, and the first two in Canada, in fact, uh, going up to uh, about the period of 1960, but make just a few comments about some subsequent uh, and later events. The uh, interest in computers uh, started uh, in Canada uh, about April 1947, when uh, three professors at the University of Toronto, uh, B.A. Griffith, V.G. Smith, and A.F.C. Stevenson, uh, undertook to make a series of visits uh, to various laboratories and, uh, and universities in the United States. Um, and um, actually, uh, a student of theirs, uh, Morris Rubinoff, whose name has been mentioned several times, uh, within a year left to join the Harvard Computation Laboratory and later on uh, the, um, the uh, advanced study team. And they decided uh, they liked what they saw and um, approached the National Research Council of Canada and the Defense Research Board uh, both to, uh, to get support uh, for further study of computers and, and eventually towards uh, producing one. And in 1948, I was actually the first person they hired uh, for that. I had just, just graduated, uh, just finished a PhD the physics and never practiced physics immediately turned into computing. And from the beginning, we were given uh, two, uh, two goals. Um, one was to do some computing uh, because the, um, the Atomic Energy Commission, the Chalk River Laboratory, really didn't have any computing facilities. And they knew quite a lot uh, about the, those at Los Alamos here, even though they were sort of banks of girls. Um, and they wanted computing done in the first place. And then the other half was to, uh, it was recognized, was to acquire some computing, uh, some computer uh, facility. The, um, the, the first part of it, the computing, was started immediately by assembling some punch card equipment, the, the kind of things you've heard talk about, the 602As, that's a name you haven't heard before, but predecessor of the 604, and card program type calculating. But he started a team uh, with that, which always did calculations right from the beginning. Um, on that team was uh, Stanley, Jim Stanley, who uh, Morris Wilk mentioned, uh, subsequently went off uh, uh, and was uh, present during the time the uh, uh, EDGE Act was commissioned or, or started working, and Beatrix Worsley, uh, who um, uh, uh, obtained a PhD with Hartree, actually, during the uh, early times. And now that, these two, among others, uh, established uh, very good connections between our group and, uh, and those in the UK. We had a steady stream of visitors. Hart, um, Hartley and, and Morris Wilkes were frequent visitors uh, from, the, from the beginning to us. Uh, and um, at the same time, I started it tour, and, and um, in 48 still visited George Stibitz uh, uh, and looked at his Bell uh, relay calculating machines and liked that enough to, uh, to think that the fastest way we could get a computer would be to copy the Bell relay machine. Uh, Stibitz was willing, and uh, Andrews, who was a sort of chief engineer, was willing, and in fact, Andrews gave me uh, about two, uh, two uh, cubic yards of blueprints to take back with me. Um, um, to um, uh, to um, uh, think about. Um, I had a very interesting time getting those across the customs. They wanted Judy, uh, they wanted to look at them, but I wouldn't let them because they were marked restricted. And I said I couldn't show them this very highly confidential thing. They, nothing could have been more incomprehensible. But um, they took me aside and finally decided that the rules which applied to bringing in blueprints for a factory would hold here. They would weigh them and charge duty according to the weight, and they wouldn't have to see them that way. So I got them into the country, all right. Uh, the, um, the, um, 
However, they turned out the National Research Council, who are supporters, didn't want to pay uh, what eventually uh, was determined as a $20,000 licensing fee for uh, copying these, which was actually a very reasonable fee. It wasn't the cost so much, but I think they felt widely that we ought to go off in the direction of electronic computers. So we assembled uh, a team, uh, again, still in 1948 uh, and, and uh, early 1949, um, of, of really graduate students uh, to look into building, who, who decided immediately that they would like to build an electronic computer. And uh, we were a very uh, sort of young, brash, and green group uh, without any of the advantages of knowledge about pulse technique and so on. But we made a lot of visits, and, uh, and we've heard so often um, how open things were, how welcome even uh, a group as, as uh, unlikely as we were um, were made at uh, places like IAS and, and others. Uh, and um, incidentally, in that group, uh, particularly the, was uh, Joe Katz, who uh, was uh, presently, the, in fact, the chairman of the Science Council of Canada, and um, uh, rats. And um, they joked about cats and rats were so numerous that he eventually changed the name to Cates. And, um, and so, so if you hear him again, that's the way he appears. And Jim Richardson, uh, who um, uh, Nick Petropoulos had mentioned, uh, worked with us about the first nine months uh, in 1948 and early 1949. And they produced a model, uh, a proposal for uh, um, uh, uh, a pilot model machine. We realized that we couldn't possibly build, um, uh, with our lack of experience, uh, a full-scale machine. And this model they called the UTEC. I've, I've made a, a kind of poor sketch for them. Incidentally, this material, um, I didn't have any material, and I ran into Jim Richardson at the cocktail party last night, and he had a sketch here at Los Alamos. Um, and he also had a sketch of some adder tube material that we also work in, very similar to the Computron that uh, Jan Rachman was working about. We went, uh, unknowing as we were, we went along several directions all at once. Um, and um, the, um, the UTEC, uh, if I could have the first slide, please, that it's no use going through the diagram in detail there, but it really is a 12-bit um, IAS machine with three bits for the instruction code. So you only have uh, eight possible instructions, one of which, of course, is no op, uh, and, um, and um, nine bit for the address. But the important thing is it was, it was to be uh, a cathode ray tube parallel store. We knew about the Williams store in 1949, only a few months uh, you know, after the invention, but, but we were, there was enough exchange of information. This was to be a parallel store, and, and particularly it was because uh, Cates had worked, uh, spent quite a lot of time working in a vacuum tube factory and knew a fair amount about vacuum tube design, and he was convinced that a two-inch cathode ray tube had the best surface uh, for it. And um, I'll just have, in finishing, in, in discussing you, take a look at the next slide, just incidentally shows the instructions. Um, uh, you might note that there's no input on it, um, the, um, and, um, and no multiplication, of course. That was a luxury we couldn't afford. Um, uh, so problems of uh, producing um, bootstrapping routines and inputs and multiplications and so on on that thing. We, we, uh, we certainly took to heart uh, Dr. Wolf's lessons about um, subroutines for that machine. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we, we actually, because Stanley and Worsley were at, at uh, Cambridge, we knew the techniques right away. And then by 1950, we were certainly using the uh, sort of calling sequences with either one or two instructions. And there's quite a lot of coding with them for that machine. And it eventually ran and was demonstrated. I'll say one more thing about it, but that will, uh, will do there. Um, and on the strength of this, um, well, two, several things happened. Um, on the, um, first of all, the expertise with this the cathedral to store was enough to lure, for uh, Nick Metropolis to lure Jim Richardson, our best engineer here, right away. And, uh, and we, we sort of lost him. But, but nevertheless, we uh, got from the National Research Council $300,000, which is a lot of money at that time, to, um, to build a, a, a large version of this machine. That was in 1950. 
and they, we, they actually gave us the money in the bank. I mean, in the university bank to start with, because we, we were going to start to build it very, very fast. It, actually, the UTEC didn't work properly until 1952, even, I might say, but, but uh, we, we uh, would have been, uh, we would have argued that it would have taken us that long to transform this 12 bit machine into a 40 bit machine. However, um, all this time, the Atomic Energy Commission kept wanting, uh, kept wanting um, results done. And then uh, it also got complicated because uh, Dr. Bullard came. And Dr. Bullard, you may remember the name of the director that Jim Wilson, Wilkinson had. And the two years before that he went to NPL, he was with us. And he had already had these equations of his, these differential equations. Uh, this was a very complex set of, um, of the hydrodynamic equation for the interior of the Earth highly nonlinear, and, uh, and we, you know, we were solving these on a, on a punch card calculator or solving tiny little bits of them, and he wanted a calculator just as much as the Atomic Energy Commission. Um, he supported us very much, and, and of course, an enormous support in, with his prestige in getting the funds. We were a very young group, and we wouldn't, wouldn't have been able to do that without him. However, um, a, a special event turned up uh, in 1951 in England, uh, namely, I, I think uh, perhaps somebody will correct me, me in this, but the um, the um, government changed, and um, the uh, the uh, Labour government took over with a great surprise uh, from the Conservative government, and the first thing they did was to cancel all orders of over one hundred thousand pounds, and um, this caused a great deal of consternation because. Um, the Ferranti machine, the first Ferranti machine had, was already operated at, at um, f um, in Manchester, and a second one was commissioned and almost ready for delivery to Atomic Energy Commission in, uh, in the UK, and suddenly the order for it vanished. So this machine, which was within months of delivery, appeared on the market. And um, we were under uh, tremendous pressure by our sponsors and donors uh, to buy this machine. So we held a great, um, we held a great conference uh, in our own group and looked at all the alternatives, alternatives and went back to them and said, no, thank you. We, uh, we have a great deal of confidence in, in expanding this uh, model into a large machine. Um, we, we, we won't have it. But uh, they wouldn't have that answer either. And, um, and they essentially said that um, if you spend your uh, if you spend your $300,000 on that machine, we will give you another $150,000 to keep you going in the study of machines, and the time will come, we're sure, when, when you will have an opportunity to build uh, another machine. And um, we uh, very reluctantly uh, undertook to, um, uh, to accept delivery of this Ferranti machine. Uh, it came in April 1952, and just about that time, I went to Manchester and spent about uh, five, four months there uh, learning to program uh, on the first uh, Manchester machine. And during which time I met, for example, Turing, who was at Manchester at that time, and quite a few of the other people we've heard about. Um, th there was a great deal of difficulty in getting that machine working. Uh, in September 1952, the ACM had its, its 7th National Conference uh, and we exhibited the machine, and, and some of you may remember Christopher Strachey chess program, uh, which incidentally uses the uh, checkers, checkers program, which used the console as a display. Uh, it, uh, it, the display part worked, but, but really not very much more. However, uh, with a lot of trouble, nevertheless, we did, uh, we did bring that machine uh, up um, into service. Incidentally, in, at that 52, we did demonstrate the UTEC finally, and the only published paper on the UTEC is in the proceedings of that conference. And I think, including the flow di the, the, the control diagram we've given there. Now, uh, quite a few um, uh, people, uh, there are a fairly important uh, stream of people from uh, Ferranti, particularly, who came over different times to help us uh, in the programming, I uh, might mention Christopher Strachey, I've mentioned already, Cicely Popplewell, uh, some of, I'm sure some of you know, each spend period, usually of a few months. 
Now, what um, the, it, it turned out that, that um, we continued in our study of machine uh, in, in, a te in, in our um, interest in acquiring and building machines. I'll say more about that, but that went off in another channel. And we, in the end, I'll, I'll just say that we never did build a machine. However, what we were injected right away was the, well, the tremendous uh, excitement and problem of using a computer. Uh, true, one that was highly error prone, but that made us develop a, a lot of checking routines. And um, there, was another, uh, there was another problem that was sitting on our desk long before the machine came that we had, in fact, had done quite a bit of it on desk calculating machine and was waiting for the computer. And it was the first one that was ever done on the machine. It was the calculations of, of the um, water level for the St. Lawrence Seaway project. And um, we uh, eventually, within about the first year of the computer, produced, um, produced a very large set of volumes of calculation, about yay thick, um, which was unusual uh, in, that, um, uh, in that we had to learn a technique for handling, sort of lar uh, systematically handling uh, sort of large inputs and large outputs and, and error check and so on. Isn't it like, I think, I, I think that that Franti machine is probably the second electronic computer per that was purchased. If you assume that the first one is the UNIVAC that went to the Bureau of Standards, I, I don't know of any that was purchased uh, between that Franti machine and, and, and ours. But in any case, um, these, um, just as an example of the sort of power of calculations on the seaway, um, the, the Ontario Hydro never told the New York authority that they had this sort of machine up their sleeve. Maybe they didn't believe it would ever produce the results. But, uh, but when they did eventually go to the um, sort of bargaining table, it was a very, uh, the results were very, very important. Uh, the calculation included uh, water levels for a large, uh, large number of rainfall conditions, and it also included three different seaways. Two of them were joint seaways shared with the United States, and one was an all-Canadian seaway. And all this time, and, and the United States Congress had not approved the seaway. There was a great deal of controversy over the seaway because, of course, it would affect the port shipping of, of, uh, of uh, cities down, uh, of New York, say. Um, however, the existence of real calculations for an all-Canadian seaway uh, played a very important role in the decision. Uh, and it's a good example, I think, an early one, of, of the sort of political influence of uh, computer calculations. Another uh, sort of example of, of uh, where, where the, uh, using the machine played an important role was in the insurance business. We, um, Toronto happens to be the site of about 15 insurance companies. And they were mostly, they were all punch card users, um, and they had actuaries who were sort of very mathematically trained and very sympathetic to calculation, to, to learning about computing. You had to be sympathetic with that frantic code. Um, the, um, they, um, and we gave courses on calculators, on, on uh, First of all, on sort of doing actuarial table calculation, but later on, and quite early, on using the machines for the prime business of computers for the premium accounting. And um, the computer, in the insurance industry, by about 1955, they were, well, they certainly got the first computers in Canada that were commercially available. And by 1960, it was completely computerized. The whole industry was computerized. And I'm pretty sure it's an example of, uh, of the talking about this uh, dissemination of technology, dissemination transfer, one of the very early ones. I, I should hasten to add that the aircraft industry, of course, had used computers continuously for their flutter calculations and matrix inversion and so on. So, so um, insofar as the scientific calculation was concerned, I think I would have to say that the aircraft industry was there first, but in their real commercial operations, I'm pretty sure the insurance industry were, were first, generally, and, and, and we I, I like to think we helped them get there pretty early in, in Canada. We ourselves, um, the aircraft people had, um, had uh, computers, I say, but they, uh, the Avro, uh, which at that time was designing um, uh, a fast, uh, in fact, a supersonic uh, fighter, uh, Avro Arrow, which eventually 
uh, which flew and, and, and then was the project where it was killed and was a great disaster in sort of Canadian, uh, not following through in that in Canadian technology. We did not have the happy uh, success in that respect that uh, Dr. Van Weingarten said. But we helped them in flutter calculations. And remember, all of this was in about the 1954 or something, 55. And um, these stabilities, um, these stabilities of, of um, problems on matrix inversion and eigenvalues and these methods that Jim Wilkinson had talked about and, 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 and Alston uh, were being developed and we sent people to conferences, but we certainly didn't know, um, we, it, we certainly learned the hard way about them in our calculations. I mean, to give one, one example, most, most of you probably know that, that you can, there's such a thing as a left and right inverse of a matrix. You can get, if you have a matrix A, you can get an approximation inverse B such that AB is very close to the unit matrix, but BA is not. Now that's well known, and you can demonstrate in a two by two matrix, but we learned it the hardest possible way in a 50 by 50. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, so we, we, we were certainly looking for the, uh, for the uh, results that came out of the numerical analysis calculation. Well, we, we had uh, many links. Um, uh, we decided that we would, con we would ex continue our, our machine building project with the ILIAC, hoping to build an ILIAC too. And for, we had a long, uh, long, profitable, successful, and friendly cooperation with the university. University of Illinois, particularly. Uh, Don Gillies, whom, uh, whom has been mentioned several times, in fact, was one of the, uh, he was an undergraduate during, in 1940, in 1950, when we were doing all of those little UTEC calculations. He uh, joined the uh, ILIAC team. Uh, we send people back and forth, sometimes for quite extended period, from a year and more to University of Illinois. And all this time, we were determined um, to build uh, an ILIAC uh, two, but that that took a long time to materialize. And by the time it did, we we realized that we would be getting a copy of a machine which would be very few of them. That is, that not many would be built. And and we had lived um, with our Franti machine in splendid isolation for quite a long time because uh, Franti changed the instruction code of the machine is right after ours. Uh, they're not very much, the, the, we had the Mark I, I think the later ones were called Mark I star, and then they went into various series. There were some good reason for that. For example, the R machine had, a, had among other things, a, a, an instruction suggested by Turing, which was a, a random number generator. It had a, a device dependent upon the shot ionic effect, which injected a random number into the computer, and that's the last thing we needed. We, 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 had, we had plenty of random number <laughs> injectors. So, um, so there were some unused instructions in the machine and, and a few other things, and, and, um, and subsequent models were different. So, so we, were, we were really very reluctant to uh, go into another series of machines that would, um, that in, in which we couldn't share on the program development of other people. We, we, and eventually, we got an, we got an, an IBM um, 7090. That was in 1962. Uh, this is past the period of incunabula, but let me just mention one or two things about that because it refers uh, it, it's reference to uh, one other point I want to make and finish within the next about five minutes. But the 7090 uh, subsequently became um, 7, um, 7094 in only about two years. And um, we did an enormous amount of work with it. It was a, as I think all of you, uh, many of you will know, it was a tremendous workhorse of a machine, very, very reliable. And we drove it day and night for years. And in fact, it just went out of uh, service last month. Um, so it operated continuously. And when I say continuously, the, you know, I guess it would be uh, not less than 80 hours per week over all that time. Uh, and, and very often 160 hours per week. So it offered continuously operated from 1962 to 1976. And incidentally, right now, the chemists are dickering uh, uh, with, the, with the sort of computer science, with the computer center and, and threatening to do something I think they shouldn't is, is take it away and, just, and, and, and run it 
without any, IBM, of course, refuses to maintain it, maintain it now, but they have maintained it until now. Now, um, that, as I say, was a tremendous workhorse of a machine. And, you know, in the aircraft company, uh, if you're looking at, at aspects of history, they, um, they, they're very proud of their workhorses. You may, uh, for example, if you, if you uh, read about aircraft, you, 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 you hear great nostalgic stories, say, of the DC-3, of how, what a terrific plane it was and how, how many of them are flying and were flying. And I think um, maybe the next phase that we ought to do of our study of history of computers is start to look into these workhorse machines, which ones, uh, which ones, uh, where can we have examples of machines that ran continuously over a long time? That IBM 7090 uh, of ours is one candidate, and I'd like to offer one more from Toronto, as a matter of fact. Um, uh, among the applications that were done on our machine was uh, traffic control. Uh, this was actually done by Cates and Company when he left the university, formed the company called the Traffic Research Corporation. And um, in 19, by 1959, he had convinced the city of Toronto that the right way to control traffic was through a computer. And they acquired, in fact, it was, he did it before then, because by 1959, they acquired a 650, uh, which, in which they had real-time uh, information fed in by sensors under the road uh, to control the traffic uh, of Toronto streets. Um, and within a year or so, that machine was replaced by a Univac. I, I'm not sure of the exact date, but um, now that machine is still running. Uh, it's still uh, controlling the traffic of Toronto streets. It was supplemented by, a, by a, I think, a 490 later, but the original one is still there. Uh, it, uh, every once in a while, there's a story in the paper that, uh, that it's getting old and parts replacement are hard to find. And uh, I drive down to work every day, and I can tell you when the machine isn't working. Um, so those are two examples uh, of uh, workhorse machines, and maybe that's uh, something we ought to do next. Um, the, the, in Canada, we, although we've, uh, we've had this good connection of people and sort of contribution of people to the state of art and applications, the, um, there's been not a great history, as you, as you can gather, of sort of successful hardware projects. The UTEC didn't see the light of the day, and we, we bowed out of the, um, bowed out of the um, uh, Illinois participation. There are some other histories which I ought to mention, because some of them are quite early, and they, and, and they are interesting. The Ferranti Group, which um, there was a Ferranti company in Canada uh, prior even to our acquisition of the machine. And of course, their engineers were very interesting, very interested, and got working with computers right away. And there was a continuous interplay between Ferranti uh, UK and Ferranti Canada. Um, and they got into machine uh, design operation quite independently. Um, um, and um, by 1960, they produced a computer called the Ferranti Gemini, which they sold to Air Canada for an airline reservation system. And I'm not sure where it is in the time scale, but it's a pretty early one. Um, and they were a very, very good team. And, um, and in 1963, they produced a machine called the FP6000. It was a twin computer. Um, Oh, sorry, Gemini was also a twin computer, but the FP6000 was one that I think Dr. Booth mentioned, and it really was a time-shared multi-program computer. Um, and um, the, however, the, um, the, the marketing and the other economics of computers didn't allow any real chance of that, of that uh, being built and marketed in Canada. It was transferred, the whole effort was transferred to UK, um, and, um, and eventually absorbed into ICL. And I think, if, I think it's fair to say that it is still the sort of the, 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 the real growth point of the ICL uh, branch of machine, that uh, FP6000, uh, if, you, um, if, if you trace the history of that. So uh, there, there, there are some respects where at least computer design in Canada seem to have had some influence, although you need a real geneal genealogy in order to trace it. Uh, another computer that was actually designed um, uh, by the um, 
Defense Research Telecommunication Establishment. Uh, it was a general purpose computer built in 1960, a transistorized machine. Uh, but uh, they, they did it without any contact with any user groups at all, and the machine sort of got up and working and, and, then, and then really never, uh, never had any applications. So um, we seem to have had a sort of number of seed points in Canada for computers. The latest one I, I, I really hope gets successful. I, um, our, our history isn't very good, but, but um, Bell Northern has, uh, this brings it up into very recent history, but just to, to, to mention it, Bell Northern, uh, who essentially uh, the, Bell, the research branch of Bell Canada, and which is separated by, uh, by really uh, a decree of, of uh, the Federal Communication System in the United States, um, um, Federal Communication Commission, um, uh, separated, had gone, in, had gone into independent design, and, and Bell um, uh, claims to be, and I think they is, or, or rather the Trans-Canada Telephone System, of which Bell is the essential research component, has offered the first uh, packet switching nationwide uh, um, computer services and telecommunications, and the technology is built upon specialized computers that Bell Northern have developed actually, these imps and, and various things like that. So they're the, they're the very, uh, very uh, interesting and uh, special computer technology which has, been, which has sprung up all, all fresh again, I might say, without any, with only uh, no direct contact with any of these previous group, with our friends and so on, which, is, uh, which may uh, contribute something uh, towards, the, uh, towards this hardware side. But, um, but I thought, in any case, I, in, in, in my presentation, I would try to give you some idea of how the applications have also spread out. We, this computer, this conference has, has uh, I think, uh, maintained its focus by staying on the, on the hardware in Cunabula. But, um, but uh, the importance of that is that computers are used. And, uh, and maybe this gives some idea of how uh, we've been able to uh, perhaps contribute to that in Canada. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Gottlieb? Uh, Bacchus, IBM. Uh, you raised a very interesting uh, question, which I think deserves more discussion. Uh, the development of computers, particularly in its very early phase, seems to be characterized, in many cases at least, by lots of, of many groups of, of young, unknown people, or largely unknown people, setting out to build a computer, which is a very expensive enterprise. And, uh, and the, the issue is, you know, how did the large sums of money that were required to do that sort of uh, become uh, available to these projects. I think that in itself is you know, a very surprising thing that this mysterious device that seemed to have uh, little practical use in the minds of, of many or, or would eat up all existing problems in a few days, uh, you know, how, how so many small groups of, of relatively unknown people got so much money. <laughs> Well, in our case, I think I've hinted it. For, for one thing, there, there, were, there were some recognized needs. Um, the the Seaway calculation were pressing on us, the Atomic Energy Commission were. And secondly, although we were very young, we were fortunately uh, sort of helped by people like Bullard and, and, and others. And initially, Professor A.F.C. Stevenson, that visiting group, were quite well-known applied mathematician. So when they went to our National Research Council for funds, you know, they got funds which, which I wouldn't have been able to get in, at that time in my day. So we were, there were people uh, who, although, uh, you know, they stood on the sidelines subsequently, nevertheless, uh, they had the vision to, uh, to support us and, 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 and lend their authority to these requests. Randall, two separate points. First, with respect to the Seaway project. I understand that Chris Strachey was one of, or perhaps the programmer on that. Um, you might like to know that amongst his papers, um, 
that are being um, catalogued by Professor Gowing's project. There are a considerable number of papers on the Seaway project. Uh, yeah, well, um, it so happened that, uh, that I was in charge of the calculation at that, that, that time. Strafey was with us for, for about three months. He was very productive and prolific, and he wrote one or two key, um, key uh, sort of subroutines on that. But they were, you know, short subroutines. I would say that that it was, um, you know, he didn't spend more than one third or one quarter of his time for the three months. But his contribution was very important. Uh, he certainly was, you know, although I had spent three or four months programming, he was he was the best programmer uh, for that machine at the time that he came there. So his contribution was important, but it was it was sort of a brief one over over a short over a relatively short period. The whole calculation went over about three years. He was there for three months of it. Second point um, to do with the Ferranti Packard um, 6000. At the conference in London in 1975, there was a paper, I think by Andrew St. Johnston, if I have the name correct, um, which talked about the genesis in Britain, in Ferranti, of the machine design, which then went over to Canada, came back from Canada, as you said, as um, now what we know as the ICL 1900, the first of the ICL, ICL 1900s. Well, I'm, um, I'm not sure, and I, 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 I think I have to um, leave it for others to indicate the extent to which the things flow back and forth. The, the people that came over from Ferranti UK to Ferranti to, Ferran to Canada tended to be the, the people who operated our computing center. They were not at all design people. And um, now Arthur Porter was, was uh, who, uh, the head of the research team. And certainly the first products you saw out of the Ferranti Canada looked very, very different. Of course, this was the implementation. And you know you could have still had the same the same uh, circuit design implemented very differently, but they went after very different modes of assembly and um, and circuit design and and thing. So um, I've heard Porter say and claim that the the ideas for the the F for the uh, Ferranti Pack Packard 6000 and FP6000 really originated in the Canadian group, but I I would hesitate I, to uh, indicate to uh, be dogmatic about that. Dr. Silesi, I can uh, speak to some part of that. I, I don't think, from what I know of it, that uh, the Canadian group did get very much feed from London. But I, certainly, it did come back the other way, because uh, at Leeds, I lost my uh, customer engineer to the group that was adapting the FP6000 to turn it into the 1900s. <laughs> And uh, another point, Kelly, uh, was it you or Christopher who wrote the program wall? The, the program? Wall in that thing, because... Um, uh, <laughs> I can't remember. I can't remember. Because I remember um, Christo Christopher yeah. telling me with great glee about how he had these flows going up on either side of the island, and he found it wouldn't settle down unless he put a uh, program in between, something in between, until the two sides had, had iterated. I think that was Christopher's. I think that yeah. was essentially one that put in artificial barriers, yeah. or essentially artificial dams, and until, and the program wouldn't converge until they, unless the water levels were within a, a sort of certain um, distance of each other, and then you could break the wall down. And Christopher, I, I can't remember. Yes, the they breaking the wall down was done by the program Trumpet. Trumpet, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd like to, uh, Neville Black, Los Alamos, I'd like to add a comment on the workhorse computer. I think, no doubt, the 7094 can be regarded as the DC-6 of the industry. I think then there's no doubt that the 1401 is the DC-3. I'm sure that uh, there must be a 1401 running somewhere that uh, holds the uh, record for time on clock. And uh, I'm a f it's a shame that these machines generally are being murdered off by withdrawal of maintenance. I, I like your analogy. I think you're quite right. The 1401 is certainly a workhorse, too. They often went together, of course, and yes. so there would be a team of horses. <laughs> uh, Householder, I'd like to add a brief postscript to my talk. Um, an appeal has been made for the preservation of hardware. And uh, when the Oracle was dismantled, 
uh, Fritz Bauer requested a piece of the uh, memory unit for the Deutsche Muse Museum, which we sent over. Uh, he told me the other day, or this morning, I guess it was, that they haven't yet been able to display it. If anyone knows a millionaire who would like to uh, present some money to the Deutsche Museum <laughs> to display the piece of the oracle, I, I'm sure it would be appreciated. Well, that, that's an interesting point. When the Ferranti machine um, was finished, when we, when we decided that we didn't want it, it went to National Research Council in Ottawa, who actually ran it for a while. And then we made arrangements for at least parts of it to go to a most marvelous museum we have in Toronto, science, a Museum of Science and Technology. If you've never seen it, it's really one of the most exciting museums there is. It's built on the side of a hill, and it covers acres and acres. Um, however, um, it then turned out that between the time the museum was planned and commissioned, they changed the philosophy. And, and one of the interesting things of the museum is that it's sort of a do-it-yourself thing. It's full of all kinds of uh, uh, gadgets and things in which you come and, and push and, and, and has to withstand thousands and tens of thousands of high school children running around trying to do their worst on it. So they decided that an electronic computer wouldn't, couldn't be subjected to this kind of um, treatment, and they never did uh, install it. And, I, and, and, and we lost the opportunity to put part of the Ferranti machine uh, into that museum. Um, I never did find out what happened to it, but, but for different reasons, museums are reluctant uh, to um, to take on uh, you know old hardware. Uh, John passed to NSF. Uh, in answer to uh, Bacchus's question about how it happened that these uh, groups uh, managed to get some monies in order to carry on their researches at universities and at national laboratories. Uh, a great deal of credit has to go to the Office of Naval Research, who supported most of the uh, early work in, in this field. And of course, uh, it is a fact that uh, von Neumann became a, an AEC commissioner in uh, 56 and started a program in the AEC, realizing that it was, it was uh, terribly important. And I have already alluded to the uh, NSF role in later years in providing machines mostly for uh, software research. But for the hardware research, I think the Office of Naval Research uh, deserves a great deal of credit. Yeah. Yes, Are there any other questions? All right, then this session is over. Oh, I think we're fair to our audience. Yeah.